Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Howland United Methodist Church. If you are a first time visitor, we ask that you stop by the welcome table and get information on our church and programs. We also have a nursery available if you have any little ones for that. Um, we're gonna start our announcements. The pre-K to second grade dress rehearsal is on Saturday from 1.30 to 2.30 here. So if anybody is in that Christmas musical, please bring them um, for the final dress rehearsal on Saturday. Third through sixth grade um, upcoming rehearsals are on Remind. Uh, the pre preschool musical is next week and the big kids are the following week. So please stop by and see them. It's going to be super, super cute. Um, our upcoming dates. Um, the preschool is doing their cookie tray fundraiser. Uh, Carrie is asking for eight dozen cookies to be dropped off by Friday, December 15th per person, by the way, not just eight dozen. The sorting is going to be on December 16th at 9 a.m. If you pre-order a tray, you can pick those up between 11 and 1 on Saturday or after church on Sunday. They're $25 for four dozen, and all of that money goes to the preschool. Hanging of the Greens is today after church. If you can stay, it's super organized. Jan Rice and her family and crew spent a lot of time organizing and sorting through things. Um, the McCrackens are, are leading the ship today, so um, Glenda and, and Andy have a list of what to do and where things go. Um, I know that right now, if you see in the church out in the narthex, there's trees with boxes in front of them, so it's going to be super simple and organized. We also have pizza, and um, Carrie is making hot cocoa homemade today, too. And there's homemade um, advent calendars today, too. And then December 2nd, next week, is our Sleep in Heavenly Peace fundraiser. It's a breakfast at uh, Cortland Masonic Lodge from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. All of those proceeds go to our Sleep in Heavenly Peace ministry. I will be out of town, but I know Cheryl is going and Sally's going. Um, Santa's going to be there. So if you have um, any desire to go out and do that, that's a great way to support our ministry. Um, our youth Christmas party is next week on Sunday at, from 5 to 8.30. We are going to be doing our Christmas caroling, so we may stop by your house. We try to get to as many church members' homes as we can, so hopefully we can get to most of your houses. Um, and then we have our Christmas party afterwards, so any youth that haven't signed up yet, please do so, so we know how much food to order for that. And then finally, our sports um, basketball league is ending. It's this Saturday is the last Saturday for that, and then we're starting up our soccer program. So if you have any kids in kindergarten through sixth grade that you know of that would be interested in coming out to our camp, that's in January, and our league starts um, at the end of January. So um, I think that's all of our announcements. Does anyone have any other announcements? Okay. At this time, if you could stand and greet one another. Um, good morning. We're going to start uh, praising the Lord today by singing Hosanna. So please remain standing and join us in singing Hosanna.
you join me in prayer? Uh, Almighty God, we, uh, we proclaim our praise to you with our voices, uh, with song. Uh, Lord, we just long to do it with our lives. Uh, we thank you for who you are and for your grace and for your love and for your power and for your presence. We thank you for being you. We thank you, Lord God, that you care about us intimately and completely. And so, Lord, as you meet us in this place, uh, cause us to meet you in this place. Uh, cause our hearts to be yielded to your heart, our will to your will. Uh, use this as a time, God, to strengthen us, to encourage us, to equip us, uh, to enable us and excite us about the opportunity of, of being your ambas- ambassadors in, in, this, in this place, in this world. So, Father, we thank you, Lord God, that you share your Holy Spirit with us. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. Move among us, stir us, comfort us, challenge us. Just don't ever leave us. We thank you for that promise that you won't. And we will give you all the glory for all that we do as we live all of our lives in ways to honor you. For we know that the only reason we can do that is because of the presence and the power and the the living sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ. So, Father, we thank you that he gave himself for us. May we now use this time that we might better give ourselves for you. For we pray this in the powerful name and the wonderful name. In the powerful name of Jesus. Amen and amen. You may be seated. (coughs) 
and I know there's something that happens next. There is no choir anthem? Oh, okay. Is Kayla still here? Good. Wow. Oh, you don't know how good that is. I, I just got to tell you, Kayla is, I, and I don't mean to embarrass her, although I don't mind doing that. She, she's, just, she's, she's just wonderful at what she does. I don't know if you've noticed that or not, but I have. And uh, I, I, I truly appreciate all of her ministries here, but especially the one she's about to lead us in. Thank you. Thank Jacob's you. already on his way up. Could the children please join me for the children's time? Come on, Jacob. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Oh, can we say that louder? Good morning, everyone. <laughs> There we go. So I have a question for you. Do you ever have to remember something? Do you ever have to remember something? What are some things you have to remember? Camden. <laughs> you do have to remember God in your heart. That's a very good answer. What do you else do you have to remember, Cameron? Your phone. Okay. Lincoln, what do you have to remember? You have to remember what? What did he say, Emma? He has to remember Emma. Okay. What else do we have to remember? Alistair. You have to remember to go to work? Okay. What about you, Emma? You have to remember to pay your bills. Wow, you are very adulty children. Lexi? You remember people that you lost? Sure. Those are all very good answers. So we have lots of things we have to remember. I'm borrowing your phone. I'm sorry, bud. All right. So we have lots of things we have to remember. How do, what helps us remember things? What do we do to help remember things? Maybe if you have homework to do or a game you have to go to, Grace, write it down. Right. I wrote my stuff down to remember what I was going to say. Yeah, sometimes we write things down, so like on a notebook with a pencil. How about, do we ever have to set a timer to remember something? Like if you're baking, how many of you bake things? Do you bake things in the oven? You have to set a timer to remember not to leave it in the oven. Hmm? Yeah, so maybe for mac and cheese. So we have to set timers. Um, some of us, if we have a phone, we might put something on our phone to help us remember, right? In our calendar or set a reminder. And sometimes we write it down on a calendar, right? How do you remember the things um, that happened a long time ago? How do you remember things that happened in the past? Those are things that we remember that have to happen in the future. What, how do we remember the past? The past, we like, like put pictures of it. Right, we look at pictures maybe. How else do we remember the past? Emma? We <laughs> dinosaurs, so maybe history, right? We look at books. Alexis? Memories and pictures, sure. So one of the ways that we remember the past is by reading books, right? So sometimes we read books about things that like dinosaurs or history, but other times we have to remember things um, that people have done. So we might read books about people. Um, what might we remember in this book? What might this book help us remember? Yes, Kim. How God does everything for the world, right? And sometimes around this time of year, we have traditions. We do things to help us remember, right? We have communion where we have the bread and the juice, and it helps us remember what God has done for us, right? And Christmas has a lot of things that we remember, right? We remember that Jesus was born and that um, the Magi gave him gifts. And we do all these different things to represent what happened in the past. So one of the things that um, the adults are going to be learning about today is uh, living for others and giving to others. So we know that Christmas is coming up and we get presents for Christmas, right? But one of the really important things to remember about Christmas is to give to others. So we can give gifts to other people. How many of you went shopping this weekend? Did any of you go shopping this weekend? How, did any of your parents go shopping this weekend maybe? Yeah, so what did they go shopping for? What did they go for, Cam? For food, okay, Lincoln. For your best friend, oh yeah, Gianna, a new what? A new tree, 
Yeah, so, and, and then probably a lot of parents went shopping for Christmas presents, right? So this time of year, we are really excited to receive presents and to get presents, but we also really need to focus on giving to others. And not just with presents, but giving our time and the things that we have to help others and to serve others. And our, the Bible helps us remember that Jesus gave something really important to us. Do you know what that is? What did he give to us? himself right he gave himself and he gave us love and so when we read stories it helps us remember that jesus gave us love and we can remember to give love to others okay so let's say a prayer about that okay bow your heads with me dear god thank you so much for loving us thank you for giving us the stories in the bible to remind us to love others and to give to others i pray that we can put others first that we can put you first in our lives and that we can live our lives to the fullest knowing that you love us and we love others in your name we pray, amen. All right, kiddos, you can go back to Children's Church. Yeah, I just wanted to, <clears throat> one of the reasons I, I said that is because one of, the, uh, one of the greeters at the door was noticed there was panic on my face this morning when it was 20, 28 minutes after 10, and I hadn't seen Kayla yet, who is responsible for, or said she'd be glad to do the children's message and the welcoming and the announcements and all those things to get us started. And I knew if we never got started, we'd never leave. And if she didn't show up, we weren't going to get started. <laughs> so it was, uh, it was good to see her at 28 minutes and 30 seconds after 10 <laughs> this morning. So that's my joy for the day. You might have some joys you want to share as well. And, uh, and you might have some concerns. Uh, both are appropriate to bring before our God who cares deeply about us uh, in every way. So if you have some joys or concerns that you share with the church family. Uh, just sort of raise your hand and they'll bring a mic. Testing, testing. Well, I have another joy. I, we had our Thanksgiving uh, dinner yesterday at my uh, nephew's house and the announcement came that uh, he is going to be expecting his first child in April, so I will be a, a great uncle. Yes, you will. I have a concern. Um, ask for prayers for the family of Sharon Steer Rogers, who passed away on Friday after fighting a long battle with a gene disease called myotonic dystrophy that was in her family. But anyway, it was, she fought the battle as long as she could, but it was a long, hard battle. So be thinking about that family. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Someone else is coming over here. The, uh, oh. the concern is my husband's cousin Donna died the Tuesday before Thanksgiving mm -hmm. and um, our joy is that we got to spend Thanksgiving with my 91 year old mother mm -hmm. and she was just so grateful oh. to have us there and we had a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you. I have a joy um, that God is so good. Taylor was in a horrible car accident mm. two days ago, and the car rolled three times. Mm -hmm. When I saw the car, I, I was terrified. She was already in the ambulance. So somehow, by the grace of God, she is sitting here yeah. with us today um, with just some soreness. Uh, thank, thank God. And um, we can replace the car. And yeah. he got me to her very quickly and mm. safely. I'm not sure how I did that from Target mm. to the site of the accident without any other problems. Um, but she's here, and I'm very thankful for that. Um, and it was by the grace of God because yeah. I don't know how the car rolled. And 
many times as it did, and she came out without one mark on her. Wow. So I'm very thankful and blessed. Praise God. I ask for prayers for 19-year-old C.J. Matchett. He was in a horrific accident. He was at college and riding in a pickup truck with his friends, fooling around, doing donuts. Mm. The car rolled over. He went, his head went out, and the truck landed on his head. Mm -hmm. So everything from his collarbone up is just broken and smashed. He's had two surgeries with about three more surgeries to go. Um, you may have seen on the news uh, yesterday there was a house fire on Thanksgiving. Um, there were 17 dogs in the home. They were being trained um, for canines. Um, the family wasn't home, thankfully, but um, the home that burnt down was actually my grandmother's house for about 40 years. Um, so the family's okay. The dogs all died, unfortunately. Um, but it's just kind of a weird feeling that, you know, my, a, ch a house I grew kind of grew up in um, is also burnt down. So prayers for the family as they um, deal with the losses. They have a seven-month-old. Um, so thank God they weren't home, and they actually live across the street from um, somebody that works for the fire department. So he ran over and, and made sure they weren't home, but he couldn't get to the dogs. Um, so it's just, it's a huge loss, and it's just so sad um, on Thanksgiving for that to happen. So mm -hmm. please pray for that family. On Thursday, Jan and I celebrated our 63rd wedding anniversary. Wow. We're so happy to be here and enjoy everything in life. Thank you. Is there anyone else? One back there. This morning I was watching the news uh, about the hostages and how some mm -hmm. of them were released. And I saw a little, I think he was seven or nine-year-old boy run mm. into his father's mm. arms. <laughs> Cannot imagine what he has experienced or his family. And I saw some of the other hostages on both sides be reunited. And praise God, they both look, you know, both sides look good. But I know there's many more, and we don't know. We just have to keep in prayer for the whole situation. Thank you. Absolutely. In just a few moments, in just a few moments, we're going to join in prayer. We'll sing a, sing a hymn prior to that. But I just want you to realize that you know, what we mentioned just so far allowed in this room. Uh, it's had to do with, with new life and life transitioning from this life as we know it to the next. Uh, it's had to do with God's protection and and, and with God's presence, even when the protection wasn't all that we wanted it to be in some other cases. Um, it had to do with relationships with one another and how important and, and how comforting and how grateful we are for them. It's had to do with our relationship with God and how much it, how much it means to be able to put our trust in a living God throughout all of these circumstances. And so we do that. Uh, this this hymn, if you'll join in, will lead you in that same direction. It is, it is, it says, you know, my faith looks up to thee. And in all of these times of both joys and concerns, our faith does look up to a living God. Join us in it.
Would you bow with me, please? <clears throat> Father, it is truly a privilege just to bow before you and bring to you uh, that which we've brought to one another to put on our hearts that we might be consistent in bringing them to you. But Lord, we know that in your hands every joy is celebrated, every concern is addressed. And so, Father, what we brought this morning are those things that have touched our lives in these current days. Uh, but we trust there are those things that have touched your life as well, in your heart. And so you guided us to, to be careful and to prayerful and concerned and joyous. And we thank you for that. So, Lord, as you've heard, each, each individual, each situation... God, pour out your very best for them and for that. And Father, we thank you that we can ask you this, knowing full well that we're asking in the will of yours, knowing full well that we're able to because of our relationship with your Son, for he is our Savior, knowing full well that we, we even have the power to do it, in the, and you have the power to respond because of the power of your Holy Spirit that lives in us and amongst us. So, mighty God, we thank you for that this morning. I thank you for each heart that, that raised their, their concern, their, their prayer, their joy. And I thank you for your heart that meets theirs. So as you do it this hour, do it for not just this hour, but for the days and all our time to come. So, Father, you're answering prayers in this place, prayers that we can give you thanks for, not just for a day or weeks, but literally forever. And we'll do it because of the one who makes the forever possible. We'll do it because of Jesus. For he's the one who taught us to pray this when we gathered. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen and amen. And if the ushers would please come forward and we will receive your giving this morning.
Woo! Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly hope. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Almighty God, we do. We praise you, Father, in every way and uh, long to praise you even in, in fresh ways, in new ways, as you would guide us. And we trust, Father, that even, even by receiving this offering for you and for the work you long to do through us and through this church and if into the life of this community and in this world, Father, that it will be, it'll be a work of praise of who you are. And so, Father, be a God of blessing. Bless those who were able to, to t- partake in this offering to you. Bless those, Father, who were not able to, Father, but bless those who will be the, the recipients of all the, of all the production and all the efforts and, and all the possibilities that will be a result of this offering. Almighty God, you're worthy of all of our praise. So we give you thanks today. In the powerful name of the risen Savior, in the powerful name of Jesus, amen and amen. And you may be seated. There's, uh, in just a moment, we'll sing Because He Lives. But the only reason I'm taking him home is I just want to say I'm surprised nobody was dancing during that, <laughs> during the offering. Ken, that was, that was marvelous. I love the way you, music can affect our, uh, our emotions and our feelings uh, and even our relationships. And after a time when we come to God with burdens on our heart, uh, we can come to God knowing that he wants to put joy in our steps and in our life, uh, even through those challenges. So thank you for leading us that way and going, taking us in that direction. And I know you only do it because he lives. Let's sing that. If you're able to sing, would you please sing that with us? God sent his son.
Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. God is good and all the time. That's so true. And, it's, uh, and I'm so thankful. I'm thankful for, for you and for that reality that God puts on our hearts to know. I, uh, I'm glad no one called this week and said, don't come back. Uh, one or two of you are. Um, I did uh, recently there was a survey done and it and it seems that uh, those folks uh, who really enjoy my preaching are happier people they're uh, more intelligent people (laughs) and they're better looking people (laughs) and I'm glad to be amongst you I really am glad to be amongst you uh, because our next days are never a given. Uh, I, I learned this the shocking way back on February 12th of this year. I was preparing. I was, it was about 6.30 in the morning at our house. and So I was up and uh, uh, getting ready. I was, I was scheduled to uh, preach at a church over on, uh, in Austin Town. And as I was getting ready to do that, something was changing within my body, I could tell. And I started to, uh, I started to get some pain, and I started to sweat, and I, started, and, and I, knew, I, knew, I, was, I knew I was in trouble. Uh, I wasn't sure what the trouble was. I'd never had a heart attack, but that's what I was, that's what I was in the throes of at that moment. I, and it turns out in the... In the next few moments, I, I had a major heart attack. In fact, I, they had to use the, the paddles on me on the way to the hospital to, to revive me. And so I can, rem- I, can remember, uh, I can remember leaving the house. When you're in an ambulance leaving someplace, they don't, you know, they don't give you a window view necessarily. But, but there was, I could see out, out, out the window uh, of the back of the ambulance, and all I could see was the very tip of our garage and I'm thinking oh Lord you know how much we love our home and this is going to be the last thing I ever see of it is, is, is underneath the eave of the garage and uh, it's funny how the mind works or doesn't work in those times uh, but, uh, but through it all and through that entire experience and I'm so thankful for, for the people that the Lord put in my, in my life certainly my wife and, uh, and then the folks at the hospital who did a fabulous job allowed me to to live a, lo- a longer life than what it was, but it, but it definitely has an effect on your psyche, if you will. I mean, on your on your whole being to some extent. I was never, I, I mean, I always knew that I wouldn't live forever, but I always thought it would be longer. You know, I always expected that I would get to be this age, but I always thought it would take longer to get this age. So I've been I've been off off pattern on time uh, many times before. But it made me think about my life, and it made me think about this life I had left. I didn't know how long I had left, and, because, and I'd never really considered that much before. So I got home, and I, I, I consulted Dr. Google, because I knew Google would give me the right answer to these questions. And, uh, you know, Google's estimation wasn't as long as my doctor's explanation, so I'm going with my doctor. For, for the amount of time that you have left after one of these occurrences and all the things that they do. But I also considered not just how long I had, but, but what I would do with what I had left. I've done, I don't know, when I say done, I've officiated uh, with, you know, well over, um, um, you know, in, in the hundreds of funerals that I've done over the years officiated at and had the privilege of sitting with family one has passed on and and uh, and getting the stories and and learning about the life and I and I'm always looking for that I'm looking you know what what mark has this life left on the rest of us what mark has this life left on those who he or she has has left behind and then I begin to ask myself, probably for the first time, what am I doing to make sure that when I leave the world, that the world's in better shape than when I arrived? What mark am I leaving on the world? 
And I knew I had some decisions to make, afresh and anew, on how I would live the balance of my days, however long they were. The reality is we all have the opportunity to make those decisions. And it really, for me, comes down to one of two choices. I could either live for myself, or I could live in order to make a difference in the lives of others. That's the same choice as you have. Well, let me say this. When you, when you live for yourself, you end up making yourself and everyone around you unhappy, ultimately. When, when you live for yourself, it, it's, hard, it's hard on everyone else who's around you. When you just live for yourself, what ultimately happens is you, you well, ultimately, you end up alone. Living for yourself leads to isolation. It leads to missed opportunities. It, it, it leads to a life that never reaches the potential. When you live to make a difference in the lives of others, that changes everything. Potential wasn't just about you. It was about the lives you touch. It was about the potential in the lives of others that becomes ignited, encouraged, affirmed, empowered. It is about you reaching your potential, but it's, it's your potential of how you can affect the lives of others. When, when, you, when you live to make a difference in the lives of others, you, you will experience deeper. You will experience fuller relationships. You will... Well, let me just... Let me just put it in a sentence. When you, when, you live, when you live for others, you make the world a better place. This isn't just my idea. God thought of it first. Go figure. But he really did. Way back in the... Where I stumbled across it this time, and where it really began to make sense to me, was in a book that, that probably many of you use for your daily devotionals now, uh, the book of Deuteronomy. Are you often there for your devotional? I'm just kidding. If you're not, don't feel, don't feel guilty. It's not a book we run to to say, you know, when was the last time? Or, or it's not a book that we necessarily think we get a lot of, a lot of uh, principles for life out of. But let me tell you something. It's full of them. Because it's a book that was, was written by, by Moses. And the last chapter of Deuteronomy is, is, it has become really uh, just a keynote chapter for me. And that's what I want to go over with you today in the next hour and a half that we have together. Uh, no, listen, if you were familiar with Deuteronomy, you wouldn't worry about that. Because the, book of, the, the, last, the last chapter in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 34... Is, is all of 12 verses long. So it, so it won't take long to read. So you can, you can read through the last chapter of Deuteronomy. You can tell all your friends and neighbors, I've studied a whole chapter today. And uh, uh, it, was, it was just 12 verses. But, but for me, I don't want to say they're life-changing, but they're life-affirming and causing me to, causing me to daily reevaluate life as I go forward. And maybe it will for you too. It's Deuteronomy was, and especially the last chapter, it talks about it talks about Moses. Moses was the author of Deuteronomy. Obviously, there was some there was some of this that others added to afterwards because Moses actually dies. In fact, the last chapter talks about the death of Moses. You remember Moses, don't you? You remember how important he was. I, I mean, if, any, if anyone ever lived for the sake of others, it was Moses. Is that right? Just sort of nod your head yes. Do you remember the story of Moses? Uh, there was a great movie about it, Prince of Egypt. All those, did you see the movie at least? Something at all? No, it's a long story, and I didn't want to have to go over the whole thing with you again. But, but Moses, is, Moses is the man who God called to lead to lead his nation, the, the people of Israel, out of, out, of, out of bondage, out of servanthood in Egypt. And so, and, and Moses had a lot of reasons. We can go back to the book of Exodus. And Moses, and Moses is credited with the books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And we can go back to the book of Exodus, and all, it talks about that great exodus of, of, crossing, of crossing the river. The seas parted. You remember that scene, don't you? It 
was a great movie. And, uh, and it's a good book. And so, so Moses had done all that to lead his people to the promised land that God was promised him to. Uh, he was, he, God used him to do more than just set them free physically, uh, but to set them free spiritually as well. He, he used Moses to establish God's law and God's covenant and, and, and God's way and power and presence among his people. Listen to this and see if you don't get all that from it. This is the 34th chapter of the book of Moses, beginning with verse 1. Then Moses climbed a Mount Nemo from the plains of Moab to the top of Pigsaw across from Jericho. Need I say any more, really? Okay, I will. There the Lord showed him the whole land from Gilead to Dan, from all, all, all of Nephalti, the territory of Ephraim and Manasseh, the land of Judah as far as the Mediterranean Sea, the Negev and the whole region from the valley of Jericho, the city of Palms as far as Zor. This is what they were looking at was the promised land. God took him up, up, up on top of the mountain to look over the promised land. Because the people of God were about to enter the promised land. Then the Lord said to him, this was just God and Moses up there. What a moment. Then the Lord said to him, this is the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when I said, I will give it to your descendants. And then he said these words to Moses, I have let you see it with your eyes, but you will not cross over into it. Verse 5, and Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in Moab, as the Lord had said. He buried him in Moab, in the valley opposite Beth Peor. But to this day, no one knows where his grave is. In a few moments, I'm going to talk about why God wouldn't let Moses enter in to the promised land. But it was, and it was because Moses had disappointed God. Uh, but God did not let him die a death of someone that God was angry with because God loved Moses with a passion. And Israel had a lot of, a lot of ceremonies for how they do their funerals, especially their funeral of, of, of honored men, and Moses was certainly an honored man. But God said, no, no, no. This one's mine. I'll take care of him. And Almighty God, the Father himself, handled Moses' funeral. Verse 7 says this, Moses was 120 years old when he died, yet his eyes were not weak, nor was his strength gone. The Israelites grieved for Moses in the plains of Moab for 30 days until the time of weeping and mourning was over. Now Joshua, son of Nun, that doesn't mean he didn't have any parents. It means his father's name was Nun. Now Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. So the Israelites listened to him and did what the Lord had commanded Moses. Since then, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, who did all those signs and wonders the Lord sent him to do in Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his officials and to his whole land. For no one has ever shown the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds that Moses did in the sight of all of Israel. That's powerful stuff, is it not? And in the midst of all that, there, there were several things that have just that struck me. And the first one is this, and, and let me say this, it's true for me, and, and I suspect it's true for you. Time comes, when your time of passing comes, you will be missed, but not forever. I, I, listen, how it should be. Listen to what he, again, verses 7 and 8 there. Moses was 120 years old when he died, yet his eyes were not weak nor his strength gone. The Israelites grieved for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days until the time of weeping and mourning was over. Friends, the sobering truth is, is when you're gone, life still goes on. Life is still happening for others. Sometimes, so, sometimes I like to think that when my time comes, when I, when I pass on, I'm no longer around, then the world's just going to spin out of control. If, if I'm no longer around, you know, nothing's really going to get 
Uh, most of life will just become a barren wasteland because I won't be around to see to everything that, that I see to. But you know that's not the case. It's not the case for me. It's not the case for you. I mean, life goes on. Here, here's a sober that I came, I came across, and this really was a, uh, a recent survey that was done. It was rem- amongst uh, funeral directors. And one of the questions was, of, of what most affects the attendance at one of the funeral services that you hold actually in the funeral home itself. And, and you know which factor more than any other will determine the attendance at your funeral? It's this. It's the weather. When it rains, people are less likely to go to funerals. That's sort of sobering, isn't it? All my life and people are going to worry about the weather report. I've got to move out of northeast Ohio if I want to be sure folks are coming to a regular basis. But listen, I'm not saying that to depress you, but rather to impress this upon you that it's a simple truth. You'll be missed, but you won't be missed forever. When you're gone, life is going to go on for others. And that's the key. Because, because underlying this is, is this truth. The way that life goes on for others will be determined by the kind of life that you live amongst them. Does that make sense? Soon the Israelites were going to face some, some, some new challenges, that they, but they were also going to have new opportunities when they went into this promised land. I, I think of us as God's people, as, 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 even as this church. Uh, you know, man, doing powerful things, wonderful things. But there's going to be challenges coming. I don't know what they are. I don't say this because I know, oh, this challenge is coming or that challenge is coming. But I know we live in a world that's constantly changing. There's constantly movements. There's, the target is, you know, that if, 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 if we exist in order to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world, and we do, well, the, the world's moving, and so the, the way we communicate that, that message has to move. We're not changing the message, but we're going to change our methods. And so programs are going to adjust, and, and all kinds of things are going to change as, as you go forward. But God's going to, going, to, going to lead you through that when it happens. Listen, the... the There'll be challenges, but there'll be new opportunities. And I don't know what they are, but if we're not open to them, we sometimes miss them. So we just have to know that if life is going on for us, and it's going on for us, then we're going to face some new challenges, but we're also going to have some new opportunities. And the mission isn't going to change to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And the way we do it isn't going to change. Wait, what do, we, what do we say here, here at Howland? What, what, what is the vision? Isn't it to invite and, and to inspire and to involve others? To invite folks to, to know Jesus and to, and, and to know one another in the context of this congregation? To inspire others to, to, to grow, to be more like Jesus in their daily walk, in, their, in the way they live their life? To involve others in serving God both inside the church and outside of the church and in the decisions that we make all day long. I mean, that's, that's the vision for how it's going to be done here. But the details of how we live into that vision are, are likely to change. But the God who's behind it is an unchangeable God who gives us an unchangeable, an unchangeable calling on our lives but gives us power to, to, to meet every challenge and to walk into every opportunity in ways that will give him glory and affect the lives of others, even those who will outlive us, or dare I say, especially those who will outlive us. Because that's where it makes all the difference. Listen, I sort of entitled my, my working title for this as I was thinking about it was living the dream because that's all we all want to do in life isn't it to live the dream listen devote yourself to a vision that will outlive you and you will be at the key to what it means to live the dream right before Moses died here's what the Bible says again he said well you know this Moses climbed Mount Nebo from the plains of Moab to the top of Pixar across from Jericho there the Lord showed him the whole land from Gilead to Dad all of the Nephati, the territory of Ephraim and Manasseh the land of Judah as far as the Mediterranean Sea the Negev the whole region from the valley of Jericho the city of Palms as far as Zor there's a verse you should re- just commit that verse to memory I'm just kidding 
But here's what he said in verse 4 once he showed him on that. Then the Lord said to him, This is the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when I said I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you will not cross over into it. You see, years before this, Moses had, Moses had disappointed God. It's found back in Numbers, the 20th chapter. When the people of Israel, the people who Moses were leading, were beginning to grumble and complain. I don't know if you've ever been around folks that do that sometimes. Moses was around a bunch of folks that were in the habit of doing that, certainly at this time. And they, won, they, wanted, they, they were upset that Moses had led them this far. They were upset that God had let the, all this happen. They, ju- they didn't want any of They even talked about going back to Egypt again. And uh, this wasn't the first time they'd been there. This was, uh, there. this was more than once. But one time when they had done this, the Lord needed to let them know that God let them know that he was still in charge and he gave and he and and he told Moses take your staff and and hit that rock and hit it you know hit it twice and water will come pouring out of it because one of the complaints they have we don't even have enough water I mean they had everything they needed every day but sometimes sometimes what you have you don't think is enough even when it is so Moses back in those back in the time that was re- recorded in numbers and earlier than that in the book of, of Exodus Moses hit the rock twice water comes pouring out of it God gets all the glory because God told him what to do and he did just what God said and so now Moses is looking at this complaining about not having not having water again same complaints how many times have you know people complain about something and then not too much longer they're complaining about the same thing again even after you thought you had addressed it once and should have put the put the issue to rest am i the only married person in this room because because my wife experiences someone complaining on a regular basis. And so having said that, they're complaining about it again, and so God intercedes again. And God, God says to Moses, he says, speak to the rock. Now here's the difference. There's a difference between speaking and hitting, is there not? Yeah, any teenager can tell you the difference. There. There, there's a difference. And in doing so, God expected Moses to honor God by doing what he said. Moses didn't do that. Moses picked up his staff. And he hit the rock with his staff so that water would come out, and water did. And then Moses took credit for it, and he and Aaron, he said, must we, meaning not God, in fact, uh, th- this is his exact words, was this, must we bring water out of this rock? In other words, the we wasn't God and I. The we was Aaron and I, your leaders. And then God said this. This is from Numbers, the 20th chapter, 12 verse. God said, because you did not trust me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I give them. Listen to me. Your failures and your mistakes will limit what you can accomplish in life. That's just a reality. It's true for all of us. I, I I, I, I often think... You know, if only I'd had greater faith, if only I'd been more obedient, if only I'd been more committed, if only I'd, I, I'd worked harder, if only I'd taken more chances, you know. I mean, and, and the if onlys are true for me, and they may be true for you too. They were certainly true for Moses. And it limited what he could do then in his life. And same thing happened, you remember David, the shepherd who would become king? Just sort of nod your head. That's another long story I know you don't want me to go into today. But it was true for his life, too. It was limited because of, because of the mistakes and, and failures he had had. It, it happens to great men. It happens to each of us. It certainly has happened to me. Our failures and our mistakes will limit what we're able to accomplish. That's why it's, that's why it's so critical to devote your life to a, to a vision that's greater than you, to have a dream that, that will outlast you. You see, here's the thing. Moses is wasn't based upon him if it was he would have quit when God told him way back in the book of numbers way back when he struck the rock years ago when God said I've called you to lead these people into the promised land but you're not going you are now not going into the promised land the minute he told minute God told Moses you're not going in the promised land if Moses was living this Moses Moses would say I'm done with this you, you find somebody else to be the leader over these unruly people. I'm not putting up with all this if I'm not even going to get, get my toe 
into, into, the, into the dust of the promised land. No, thank you very much. I'm not in it for that. I'm in it to experience it. If it was, if it was based on that, if Moses' vision was based on what he could get out of it, he would have been done with it. Does that make sense? But it was based on the vision that God had for his people. What you do cannot be based on you. It must be based on God's vision for those people who are around you. Your dream, your dream must not be based on you. Even, because even without Moses' leadership, where did the people end up going? Into the promised land. Where, even without Moses' leadership, the, God got his people where he wanted them to go. It's not, a, it's not a case that if Moses can't go in the promised land, nobody else can go in either. Because, oh, no, no, we can't go into the promised land. Moses isn't our leader anymore. It wasn't about Moses. They di- and they didn't need Moses at that point. And Moses, Moses didn't live, live a life that said that's what they needed. He lived a life that said they needed to live into God's vision for their life. And he gave them a vision of what it would be like in the promised land and that they would want to live there. I, I know this uh, pastor man down in... Uh, Disney World, some I know in the in the past couple of weeks with the family and uh, in those things, and I was thinking about Disney World. I've I've never personally been there. I, I told that Matt that three times before he left, and he didn't meant nothing to him. <laughs> and uh, but I haven't. But I but I know a little bit about it because I, I've always been intrigued with Walt Disney. Uh, Walt Disney, of course, it's called Walt Disney World. There's a reason for that. Back, back in 1963, Walt began buying property through, through various companies in Florida. In, in central Florida, where there wasn't much of anything, he bought thousands of acres through a variety of companies, none of which had his name on it. He didn't want anyone to know what he was doing, what, what was planning, what was going on. And then in, in 19... In 19, uh, yeah, 1966, they, they announced that they were going to build Disney World. They had, they had bought these thousands of acres, and they, and they began construction on Disney World, whatever that would look like. I, they did that. I'm, I got my dates wrong. In 65 and 66, Walt Disney died. His wife lived on, Lillian. His brother Roy sort of took over the corporation and the operation. In 1971, they had the grand opening of Disney World. And, and up on the podium and on the stage was, of course, Lillian, Walt's, Walt's widow, and, uh, and his brother Roy. And Roy turned to Lillian and he said, Oh, I, I, I wish Walt could have seen this because it was phenomenal. And Lillian turned to Roy and she said, oh, Roy, Walt saw all of this. You see, he was a man with vision. And when God gives us a vision, when God gives you a vision, you see things that are more than than even your hand will hold. Listen, if you want to make a difference with your life, you need to devote yourself to something that is bigger than you. You need to devote yourself to something that will outlive you, that can outlast you. I, I always want my vision to be bigger than, greater than something I can personally accomplish. I want my eyes to see more than my hands will ever hold. I want the work to continue long after people have forgotten who I am, whatever it be. And the only way that happens is if I, is if I take seriously the opportunity to build into the lives of those around me. The only way it will happen for you is you take seriously to live into the opportunities to build into the lives of those around you. Verse 9 says simply this, Now Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. So the Israelites listened to him and did what the Lord had commanded Moses. Do you see what I'm saying here? Joshua led him in. How was Joshua able to do that? Because he was, he was tutored under, under Moses. Moses laid his hands on him. Moses, Moses spent his life building into the life of Joshua. So Joshua, and Moses didn't know it was going to be Joshua, but he did it, he did it because God had given him the vision to do that because God knew that Joshua was going to lead them into the promised land. 
That was the most important work Moses did in all of his life. The most important work you will do in your life will be the work you do building into the lives of others because that's God's plan for God's people is to build into the life of others. Uh, it's, it's, it's almost like we're part of this gigantic generational uh, relay team and we're passing the baton on to the generations that will follow us. If you live life right those around you and those after you will always accomplish more than you do. Moses didn't enter the promised land, but he could celebrate the fact, and God took him up on that mountain to celebrate the fact that God's people were going into that land. And he could celebrate the fact that they were going to experience the land of milk and honey. Listen, I see, that, I see that going on here all the time since Forget and I have been attending here and all the things that have been going on and, and all the people, who, the people who lead the various different ministries and activities, they're not doing it for their own glory. I see very little of that. What I see is they're doing it for the betterment of the folks who are taking, a, taking part of them. They're doing it for the betterment of others. I mean, the children left this morning. They went someplace. And that's because there's, there's attendants and there's children's workers and volunteers and there's people that have been in the nursery all morning helping out with the little ones so some adults can be in a room. There's the hospitality team, the greeters. They're not doing it for their glory. They're doing it so you'll feel comfortable being here. The multimedia and the sound team, they even put themselves up where nobody gets to see them. And they do that, though, so that you can see and hear everything that goes on that's pertinent. The, the children's ministry leaders and all the ministries for the children, the Sunday school teachers. They're doing it for others. Your vacation Bible school, which touched so many lives, even this past year. All those people put in all those hours and all that effort for the sake of the children, for others. All the ministries and musical ministries and, and beyond the praise team and Ken and the choir and, and all the programs. They're, they're, they're not for their own glory, but it's for the benefit of others like us who get to appreciate that. The, the youth ministry and all of their activities, the, the annual trip to Appalachia is led by people who care more about others than they do about themselves. The various sports ministries that are now taking place, all led by people who care more about others than they do themselves. None of that's easy. It's not easy to come out and unload food and repack food in, in backpacks and stuff so that other people, you know, other people have enough to eat when, when times get hard and, and tables get barren. So the, the whole backpack food ministry ministry is led by people who care more about others than they do themselves the soup kitchen ministry that literally feeds hundreds when they do when they when they serve at the soup kitchen is caring more about others than of themselves sleep in heavenly peace ministry build beds building beds this is more than just than just bed building this is literally if you've ever if you've ever been in conversation and i have with young people entering their teenage years and have never had, a, never had a bed of their own, and all of a sudden they have a bed of their own. That's not just a bed. That's life-changing stuff. And, and people are leading that because they care about changing the lives of others, the support for scouting and even Operation Christmas Child. When you, you'll, until you get home, chances are you'll never meet the recipient of the, of the shoebox that you pack for the Christmas child. But you do that because you care more about others than you do yourself. Listen, if your dream is to help others live into their dream, then you're going to accomplish more through the people who come after you than you will accomplish with your own efforts. So devote your life to building into the life of others. If you want to invest your life to live the dream, then dream about investing your life into building up others. Make it your life's work to help, to help people, to help ease their suffering, to help connect them to Jesus, to help connect them to opportunities, to help increase their knowledge, to reach their potential. Your greatest impact will be what you accomplish through others. You're, when your time comes and you leave this world behind, let me say this, life is going to go on but it doesn't have to go on as if you weren't among us. It'll go on with lives that are transformed because you were among us. Ask yourself, ask yourself this question. Am I living for something bigger than me? Am I inspiring someone else to live towards greater things? Am I investing my life in building up other people? 
say, I want to do that. Let me tell you the best way to do that. I'm, I'm going to, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to give you three prayers. Take my seat. But I want to say this. If you really want to invest your life living for others, then consider these three prayers. They're short prayers. You can really say them every day, but don't do it if you don't mean it. And if you mean it, don't, don't stop it. The first one is this. Lord, break my heart for what breaks yours. That was even in the song Hosanna this morning. Break my heart for what breaks yours. Lord, I, I, when I, what I'm saying is I want to put my efforts in a place where you want them to be. The second one is this. Lord, let me see other people the way you see other people. Don't let me buttonhole them the way I'm quick to do. Let me see them the way you see them. That's just as easy, but just as life-changing. Lord, today, let me point someone to Jesus. Yeah, you don't have to explain the, you know, the, the Roman road or the, you know, any hand them a track. You just have to, something in the conversation will point them to Jesus. Something, prayer, something might mention the power of Jesus in your life, but point them to Jesus. Because can I tell you something? When you think about your life, it's not about you. Rick Warren wrote a book a number of years ago in The, the Purpose Driven Life, and the first, first four words was, it's not about you. I, I ran into those words several years before he published the book. I was in, I was in Dallas and to be at a meeting with Max Lucado, and Max had just, I wasn't in Dallas, I was in Phoenix. Max had just been in Texas, and he came from there, and he'd been with a friend. And uh, he, it was a friend that he said always had insights on what was happening. And, and he said, it. so I asked him, well, what are you learning? And he told Max this. He said, I've learned this. It's not about you. Life is not about you. I came back. I was pastoring a small church on the east side of Youngstown at the time in Camel. And, and uh, one of our sons was worshiping with us. And he knew that story and, and how much it had impacted me to be there in Phoenix and hear that and changed it took the pulpit one Sunday and there was a, one of my business cards but on the back of it it had these words it's not about you and he put it my son that put it up there so that it would always be before me when I left that church and went to the one in Warren that's probably about the only thing I really took from that pulpit area was that card that said it's not about you actually I didn't take it uh, I just went there to preach on the day after I was introduced and uh, that child of ours had already been in the sanctuary and he picked up the card and brought it there so I walked behind that pulpit it said again it's not about you you want to do something make a little note to yourself someplace maybe put it on your desk or put it on the mirror that you look at every morning when you're getting ready to face the day and let it just say it's not about you See if that doesn't change, improve the, the way you view others and you view life and you live life in a way to change the life of others so that your life will outlive your life. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you that you give us this opportunity to live life to the fullest. I want to thank you for the privilege of actually doing that. Knowing that the fullness isn't about us, but it's about how we live our lives for others. So God, help us to do it well. Help us to do it with wisdom, but help us to do it. God, you know it's not about where we are, but where we're going and how we get there. Might we leave a path behind us that others would long to, uh, would long to follow because they long to follow you. Give us the vision, Father that you have for our lives and for the lives of others so that we can live our lives so that they can fulfill their vision. We just thank you for that, that powerful privilege in the powerful name of the risen Savior, the one whom you call Son and we call Savior. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you're able to rise, would you rise and let's close together with be thou my vision. Be 
thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, thy presence my light. Be thou my wisdom. And thou art my word, I ever with thee, and thou with me, Lord. Thou and thou only first in my heart. Great God of heaven, my treasure thou art. Great God of heaven, my victory. Friend, C.S. Lewis said this. He said, you can't go back and change the beginning. But you can start where you are and change the ending. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. And may God's vision for your life become your story. Amen.